Daryl Hager, uh, and Dr. Kristen Sullivan, the director of the uh, War Museum of Wildfowl Art in Salisbury, Maryland, has asked me to uh, answer some questions about my history and interest in uh, collecting decoys. Um, and the first I'd like to address is the uh, how I got started collecting decoys. When I came uh, as a faculty member to what was then Salisbury State College in, in Salisbury, Maryland, uh, I had uh, no idea what a decoy was. Um, unlike many of my friends in the decoy community who began uh, uh, early in their lives using decoys, either going out gunning with their fathers or other family members, uh, I, on the other hand, grew up in, a, uh, in an area um, I grew up in West Texas, uh, where there was no waterfowl to gun. In fact, I grew up in Odessa, a town of about 125,000 people, but it got its municipal water supply from a man-made lake 95 miles away. So, as I say, when I came to Salisbury State, I had no familiarity with gunning or, or with decoys. Uh, and then in 1974, five when uh, I was going to attend the first graduation ceremony at, at that college. Um, I was interested in, in how this institution would go about that procedure because having done it at a couple of other universities, I realized that a significant part of a graduation ceremony was the uh, awarding of honorary degrees to politically or financially significant people, people who could help the institution uh, one way or another. And uh, when we got into the auditorium and were seated, I began looking at the program for that particular ceremony. And I saw that we were awarding honorary degrees to two barbers from someplace called Crisfield, Maryland. And I had no idea who these people were. I had no idea where Crisfield was, even though I learned later that it was only about 25 or 30 miles away from Salisbury. After the ceremony at the graduation reception, I had a chance to uh, uh, meet and, and visit briefly with Lim and Steve Ward. Uh, but I still I didn't understand exactly who they were and, and why they were so important that we were giving them these, these, these recognitions. At that time, uh, the college had given part of one of its buildings to uh, the Ward Foundation to house the first uh, Ward Museum of Wildfowl Art. And the museum happened to be in the building where I had my office. So during times when I was taking breaks, I would frequently walk around this museum area and look at all these cases filled with wooden ducks and wonder what this was all about. Gradually, I began to, to notice that I kept going back to this one particular case that had uh, a pair of canvasback decoys made by Sam Barnes. For some reason, the form and the paint of those particular decoys just appealed to me. And uh, I decided at some point in these visits to learn what I could about this particular art form. And that's what I began uh, doing some research and um, learning more about this, this art. I realized and discovered that um, I lived in an area uh, which made it very easy to contact some of the leading experts in, uh, in decoys. Henry Fleckenstein lived only half an hour away. Michael Kading uh, had a decoy shop uh, in Easton, which was only about 45 minutes away. And John Sullivan, although he lived uh, across the bay on the western shore of Maryland, uh, visited his very good friend Henry Fleckenstein often enough that I got to, uh, to know him. And these three men and others uh, were always more than willing to answer my questions, to share their knowledge with me and to give me uh, their advice on how to get started building uh, a collection. And some of the advice that they gave me was to um, uh, focus in on a particular area or a particular maker 
uh, and, and to start there rather than just try to collect every decoy from any region or from wherever. Uh, kind of focus your, your energies and your resources uh, into a particular area. And for that reason, I decided to start collecting decoys from the upper Chesapeake Bay, the area known as the Susquehanna Flats, which was the major gunning area for the nation in the uh, late 19th and first half of the 20th centuries. Um, so I began collecting decoys from Harford County, Maryland, and Cecil County, Maryland, the two counties on either side of the Susquehanna River. And uh, as I began doing that, uh, I, I started studying the, the general differences between these two decoys. First of all, uh, most of these decoys from this area are um, two-piece decoys. The body is carved out of one large piece of wood. Uh, and the head is carved out of another. Uh, the decoys are not hollow, they're solid. Uh, and then the head is attached generally with uh, three nails uh, to the body. One of the things that I learned rather quickly was to never say never and never say always when talking about people or decoys or anything else. Uh, because in general, Cecil County decoys have these characteristics. This, for example, this is a decoy by Henry Lockhart from Cecil County. Notice the tail here is relatively straight out from the midline of the body. And if you look under the head here, that black area, you'll see that there is actually a shelf that the head sits on and that shelf is carved as a part of the body. So these are two general characteristics of Cecil County decoys. On the other hand, Harford County decoys generally have a tail that flips up in this fashion. And if you look under the head, there is no neck shelf there. The, the body is flat and the head is uh, carved to just fit directly onto the body without the shelf. Now, as I say, it's always best to say generally because the first two Harford County decoys that I picked up to illustrate this today, both had neck shelves. Um, and you'll find neck shelves on the early carvings by uh, John Daddy Holly and his son Jim. And in fact, Henry Lockard from Cecil County started off his career using a very prominent neck shelf. But then as he progressed to the last style that he carved in, there was no neck shelf at all. So in general, those are characteristics that uh, help identify Cecil County and Harford County decoys. And those are the decoys that I started focusing in on. Once I decided to uh, collect decoys from Harford County and Cecil County, um, I discovered uh, a piece of art by an artist named Paul Schertz. He did this major print called Decoy Makers of the Susquehanna Flats. And on it, he illustrated uh, close to 40 uh, different decoys, uh, each made by uh, a different maker. And I know many collectors, many beginning collectors, use this print as a guide uh, uh, as they try to identify decoys and as they uh, built their collections. The, uh, the goal was, of course, to try to collect as many of decoys as possible that were on this print. <clears throat> so that's what I, I began doing. And as I got close to having those, uh, most of those on the, uh, on the print, uh, I realized that I, I stood in danger of reaching the, the end of the goal there and how, I, how was I going to justify to my wife, Kathy, uh, continuing to buy decoys if I had one of each of these representatives. Uh, and then I discovered that uh, unintentionally, I had uh, in this process purchased a number of decoys with brands on. If one has a decoy by a maker, but then discovers another, another decoy by the same maker that has a brand on it, then that's of course justification for buying another decoy. So that's what I did. Uh, and I became very interested in decoys with brands. This decoy by uh, Dick Hipple has the brands, or the brand, H. H. on it for his son, Harry Hipple. Uh, Dick Hipple made this rig in the 1940s uh, for his son. Uh, but then 
as I began to research brands, I discovered that a brand is, it's really a, a tremendous thing because it, it enables a collector to establish what the collector calls the provenance of a decoy. It enables us to put the decoy in the particular hands of a gunner or in the particular rig of a gunning scow, such as the Reckless or, or the Widgeon, uh, or a particular hunting club, like the Spitsuti Island uh, Rod and Gun Club, or the uh, San Domingo Farm Club. But these brands are significant historical features that enable us to put decoys in place and time. And they're such an important uh, uh, feature of, of these the history of the decoys. Another area of interest for me came about because of the comments by another mentor of mine. Uh, for years, uh, Sam Dyke was the curator of the Ward Museum. And um, when I got to know him, he was another one of those knowledgeable people who was always willing to take the time to talk about decoys and share knowledge. And he had a decoy, a preening canvasback drake by Chauncey Reynolds that he, he showed me one time. And this decoy, again, is a, a preening drake by Henry Lockard. Uh, but it's this form, you know, uh, when you look at, you know, this, what the collector calls this attitude, the, this different posture, the head is turned back over the body in a resting pose or a preening pose. This is the more traditional form, straightforward decoy looking right straight ahead. This is a functional decoy. Um, it, it's going to work. It's going to bring in the ducks. It's going to enable the hunter to do what he needs to do. But as Sam Dyke explained to me that at this point, more is going on than, uh, than just making a functional decoy. This form, this attitude was made to satisfy some curiosity or some need in the uh, carver. At this point, we go from a functional decoy to a work of art, something that's done not to attract ducks, but to satisfy this, this need inside the artist himself. And so for that reason, I became interested in decoys that displayed uh, attitudes, turned heads, swimming postures, preening uh, decoys, sleepers, uh, these are all attitudes, postures that show the transition from a purely functional decoy to the work of art. And that's where uh, the, the World Championship Carving Contest of the Ward Museum is at this moment in time. You know, they're showing us the, the, the ultimate development of the art form from the very functional decoy of the 1850s to the brilliantly creative, finely detailed carvings of uh, today. Before I can talk about my favorite decoy, uh, I, I need to establish that uh, uh, my favorite decoy maker, or makers in this case, because uh, as I was working with that print by Paul Schurz that I referred to earlier, the one decoy that my eye kept going back to was uh, a, a Drake a canvas back by Henry Lockard. There was just something about the form, the, the, the look of that decoy that, that really caught my attention and made me want to find a decoy that looked like that more than any other decoy on that whole print. Uh, so I began focusing on decoys by uh, George Lockard and by Henry Lockard. Um, and another thing that interested me, interested me about these two men was that uh, there wasn't a lot known about them. Uh, they were rather obscure. We didn't have good examples of their, their work. We didn't know much about their histories. So at one point, uh, I began doing research on these brothers and then trying to uh, reveal more information about them. And ultimately, I was able to, uh, to complete an article uh, devoted exclusively to uh, the brothers. Uh, and, and in that process, I got to know members of the family. I got to know two granddaughters of, uh, of Henry Lockard and two grandsons of uh, George Lockard. And these, these two, uh, uh, these four people shared a lot of knowledge about these men uh, with me. And in that process, uh, Harry Reynolds, who became a good friend of mine, um, 
with one of the grandsons of George Lockard, uh, brought me into his house where he had laid out all those George Lockard decoys that he still had uh, uh, in his uh, collection. And he told me as uh, we were nearing the work on this article that he wanted me to have one of these decoys and I could pick the one that I wanted. Um, and we talked about that for a while. And I think when I made my choice, it somewhat surprised Harry because most people given a choice of uh, decoys, for some reason, always pick a Drake. Uh, they, they want to see a, uh, a Drake decoy. My choice was this hen decoy by George Lockard. And when I made this selection, Harry asked me why I had uh, uh, wanted this one. And I explained to him that this is the one that will always mean most to me because of the things that we can know historically about this decoy. First of all, we know it was made by George Lockard, but also here, you see this large the nail. The family calls that a tack. I would call it more like a roofing nail. That was the nail that George Lockard used to identify decoys from his personal rig. Then, if you can look back here, you will see two more smaller tacks near the back of the weight. And these are the tacks that were uh, placed by Philip Birchall Reynolds, who was the son-in-law of George Lockard and who inherited the rig after George Lockard died. Philip Birchall Reynolds was Harry Reynolds' father. Now, we don't have, we didn't have at this time an original paint decoy by George Lockard, but Harry told me that his mother, Ethel, uh, uh, George's daughter, was taught by George to paint his paint pattern. And uh, Harry also told me that these decoys, which he had used uh, uh, to gun over as a youngster, uh, were sometimes, he would repaint the drakes. But for the hens, he never repainted the bodies. He would repaint the brown area, he would repaint the head, but he never touched this area in here because he knew that he would not be able to reproduce anything as appealing as that particular paint. So I told him that another reason for my selecting this decoy is because this paint here was applied either by George Lockhart himself or by his daughter, Ethel, Harry's mother. And then lastly, this decoy was handed to me from the hands of Harry Reynolds, the grandson. So this decoy has so much history and so much personal meaning to me that uh, it's, it's definitely my favorite and will always be with me. And I'm not uh, sure that I can give anyone advice in such a, a, a personal area, but uh, there are some things that I would say. And the first thing is keep it simple. Collect what you like. Don't worry about what other people collect or what you think people uh, would would uh, expect you to collect. Collect what you like because if you do that, then over the years you're going to stay satisfied with what you have and you're going to be able to build your collection around your personal preferences and interests and collections. And the second thing that I would say uh, is more difficult to do during these times of um, constraint, restrictions while we are quarantined in our homes during this COVID-19 crisis. But the most important advice that I can give anyone is to handle as many decoys as you can. Get out when we can and go to as many museums as you can, go to as many decoy shows as you can, visit as many individual private collections as you can, uh, handle as many decoys as possible so that your body of knowledge, your, your familiarity with decoys and decoy makers builds and accumulates over time. But the more opportunities that you take to handle decoys, to examine them, to listen to other people talk about them, 
the more informed your decisions will be about making purchases for your collection. And you'll have, I think, a much greater chance of being satisfied with the, the final collection that you have in, in your home. So please collect what you like. And in doing that, take as many opportunities as possible to get out there and handle decoys and talk to people about them.